good evening um am i audible and visible if i'm audible and visible can i see a thumbs up please good evening shafiq good evening agni so um thank you good evening varun so if you're joining my session for the first time thank you all Uh, if you're joining my session for the first time, this is Dr. Shanmugam Priya, an academic educator for biochemistry, and uh, today's session is all about top topics for NEET PG 2024. And uh, before we start the session, so my plan for this session is to uh, tell you what are the important topics that you need to concentrate on, be it NEET PG or next PG. I know that there is a confusion that is uh, happening now. you're all anxious to know what about neat pg 2024 what about next pg so who will be writing which exam so uh, i will be briefing a bit about um, this confusion in terms of my thoughts about this and then i will be telling you the important topics that you need to uh, be prepared for be it neat or next and then we'll be discussing few mcqs based on these top topics okay so that's the outline for today's session and before we start the session let me tell you few facts about uh, an academy's plans so to unlock your potential now prices have dropped and you can save up to 25 percentage on all an academy need pg subscriptions we have an ace next batch and the duration of this batch is 6 months and it starts on 21st june and the offer price currently is 14344 and this is valid till june 17th and to get this offer you can use any code uh, if you want you can use my code which is my name c shanmugapriya good evening samuel so you can use my name which is c shanmugapriya okay um so uh, i hope you all know about the neat pg vitals which is uh, recorded videos for comprehensive neat pg preparation totally there are 800 plus hours of hours of comprehensive recorded sessions for all 19 subjects and is an exclusive content created by all of us and this comprises of pyqs image based questions and clinical case based questions so for you to have a comprehensive understanding my uh, view is if you are going to appear for next then you need a comprehensive understanding of all the subjects for which need pg vitals will be of great help and there is a mega scholarship exam that is uh, scheduled and uh, you are assured of scholarship up to 100 percentage and top 3 learners will get free mentorship session from top, top faculty and uh, this exam is scheduled for 18th june and there will be 100 questions and the duration of this uh, exam is 2 and 1/2 hours it starts at 11 am ends at 1:30 pm okay so that's all about an academy's plans so now about uh, the most popular question that is in all your minds is it going to be neat or next um so do we have to really answer this question i would say no yeah beat neat or next of course uh, the next exam is uh, scheduled for 2019 students those who joined mbbs in the year 2019 uh, there is an announcement that came up recently which says that they will have to write the next exam uh, so if your question is what about interns and post interns will there be a neat exam in between and then will do we have to switch over to next i would say please don't waste your time boggling about this question okay because need or next i would say the preparation strategy is going to remain the same so need or next date of exam nothing is announced so far samuel it is just that 2019 students will be appearing for next exam that is all we have, uh, we have been told okay the rest everything else is speculation so if you are asking me need or next which will be easier will need be easier will next be easier my answer would be uh next will be an old wine which is served in a new bottle okay in the sense you will have to read all 19 subjects comprehensively for next exam as well it is just that you will not be given enough time for preparation so soon after your final year course is over you will have to appear for next that's the only difference that i see between neat and next otherwise or because they are, what they are trying to replicate is they are trying to replicate usmle step 1 and if you look at the way usmle step 1 is asked there will be a clinical mcq and for you to answer that clinical mcq you should have integrated it to a preclinical and a paraclinical subject so all that you will have to do is learn all 19 subjects conceptually and go and appear for this exam 
if it's the first next exam my assurance is it's going to be a simpler one okay so don't be worried about neat or next okay now what are the high yield topics that you will have to learn as far as biochemistry is concerned uh, what do you think is the most frequently asked topic as far as biochemistry is concerned i know that all of you know the answer for this question which is the most frequently asked one i would say it's vitamins right so hands down it's going to be vitamins even the latest neat pg exam out of the 16 mcqs very good is yes. sphingolipidosis right very good so out of the 16 mcqs which were asked in the latest neat pg exam uh, seven mcqs were based on vitamins so do not uh, miss reading about vitamins but if you ask me don't go and straight away start reading vitamins because vitamin is all about you integrating all the metabolic pathways b thiamine or b6 or b12 how will you be able to learn about all these vitamins all these vitamins you'll be able to understand only when you have a basic understanding of metabolic pathways yeah all of a sudden if i say thiamine is necessary for rbc trans ketolase activity if you just memorize it's not going to be of use so have a basic understanding overview of all the metabolic pathways and then start learning vitamins and then vitamin what are the topics that you will have to learn like your school days do not go and just memorize about sources of vitamins do not just memorize about rda of vitamins what kind of questions are asked in vitamins in neat pg it is predominantly deficiency manifestations because it is all about clinical application of anything that you learn okay so as far as vitamin is concerned what do they ask they ask you deficiency manifestations which can be asked as an image based question how many of you have seen the question on phrenoderma yeah as and when we learn about these topics let me also give you examples phrenoderma a small boy was show was uh, showing his elbow and in the elbow small papular lesions were seen and in the tip of these papular lesions there was a keratin plug so what is it called as that is called as follicular hyperkeratosis very good samuel yes it is follicular hyperkeratosis which is caused by vitamin a deficiency or essential fatty acid deficiency so it can be asked as a case based mcq or an image based mcq and apart from deficiency manifestations they ask you about investigations that you will perform to detect vitamin deficiencies for example they ask you thiamine if you suspect thiamine deficiency what will you estimate you have to estimate rbc trans ketolase activity yeah if you suspect b6 deficiency can you all answer this b6 ends with which letter x so what will you estimate you will have to estimate xanthiuric acid levels so these facts you will have to memorize b6 deficiency what will you estimate xanthiuric acid levels and if you suspect folate deficiency folate starts with which letter f so what will you estimate figlu levels will be estimated in urine okay so these investigations you should be very clear about it is not about rda it's not about sources you will have to learn about clinical manifestations and clinical management and after vitamins the next most common topic would be molecular biology yeah how many of you like molecular biology yeah irrespective of whether you like it or no you will have to learn genetics yeah because the way forward yeah in medicine there is a rapid progression towards genetics and precision medicine or personalized medicine so for you to be able to practice good clinical uh, medicine you will have to have a strong foundation of genetics so do not fail to read about genetics now okay and in molecular biology do you have to learn about everything no point in learning about everything i will tell you just few sub topics in genetics which you will have to definitely learn the one is types of dna polymerases right they keep asking you about dna polymerase epsilon which helps in leading strand synthesis which helps in okazaki fragment synthesis so for you to answer these questions you will have to definitely learn about types of dna polymerases dna repair mechanisms let me ask you a question which is the cause of hereditary non polyposis colon cancer hereditary non polyposis colon cancer or lynch syndrome 
okay it ends with 2c right it is caused by the defect of 2m what is 2m mismatch repair defect don't forget this this has been repeatedly asked so they can give you a case based mcq a 35 year old male presents with colon cancer okay and genetic analysis reveals multiple uh, microsatellite instability yeah what is the most common cause of hereditary non polyposis colon cancer what will be your answer is a defect of mismatch repair so dna repair mechanisms you will have to definitely learn about and then pcr what do you think should you learn in pcr it is not enough if you just know pcr is polymerase chain reaction what should you know you should know requirements of polymerase chain reaction you should know the steps of polymerase chain reaction can anybody tell me what are the steps of polymerase chain reaction yeah you can remember it as d a e what does d a e stand for very good steep steps are asked denaturation every cycle of pcr will go through three steps what are the three steps denaturation annealing and elongation okay tell me denaturation is carried out at what temperature that is also a frequently asked question denaturation is carried out at 95 degree annealing is carried out at what temperature very good trishita very good dr h so annealing is carried out at 5 degrees less than the melting temperature of your primers okay elongation is carried out at 72 degree so what should you know you should know requirements of pcr you should know steps of pcr and they have always asked you about clino fragment yeah what is clino fragment that you should be very clear about and then recombinant dna technology the last neat pg there was a question on dna sequencing dna sequencing was first done by sanger and what is the method used by sanger it is termination method yeah sanger's termination method or di deoxy nucleotide triphosphate method so do not forget to learn about dna sequencing and also learn facts related to human genomic project yeah because recently it got over it got completed so you'll have to know details of facts related to human genome project okay so these are the sub topics that you will have to learn as far as molecular biology is concerned if you know this mostly you'll be able to answer um, all the mcqs okay so that's about molecular biology and after that as you all know you will have to know about inborn errors of metabolism so what are the sub topics that you will have to learn in inborn errors of metabolism so my humble request to all of you is just do not memorize mnemonics to understand inborn errors of metabolism it is not enough if you just remember that anderson's disease is caused by the defect of branching enzyme it is not sufficient if you know that cori's disease is caused by the defect of d branching enzyme how do you learn all these a followed by b anderson is caused by the defect of branching enzyme c is followed by d cori's disease is caused by the defect of d branching enzyme it is not enough if you just use mnemonics and just memorize the names of the enzymes how many of you went through the last neat pg exam paper there were three mcqs on glycogen storage disorders did you all see that yeah there were three mcqs on glycogen storage disorders and all those three mcqs were case based okay there was a detailed history which was given and they asked you one fact about that disorder so you will have to know in detail about clinical features of all these glycogen storage disorders i've included those mcqs today for discussion so after we learn about top topics of uh, neat pg 2024 or next pg i will be discussing few mcqs based on this okay cori's disease and von geer keys in mcq okay for the benefit of sample let me tell you the differences between cori's disease and von geer keys disease so all those who are watching here both these conditions will present as fasting hypoglycemia what do you think about fasting hypoglycemia the history will be classical like what they gave you in the latest neat pg they would say between meals the child presents with hypoglycemia which means it is fasting hypoglycemia which responds to food intake that will be common to both the conditions but the difference is cori's disease will also present with exercise intolerance 
So all of you tell me what are the two conditions which present with both hypoglycemia and exercise intolerance that is Cori's disease and type 0 glycogen storage disorder. Can you memorize it? Yeah, because it's going to be uh, a session wherein I'm trying to give you an overall view of how to learn biochemistry. I will not have the time to explain the concept behind it. But for now, please remember there are two glycogen storage disorders which present with both hypoglycemia and exercise intolerance. One is type 0 glycogen storage disorder. The other one is Cori's disease or type 3 glycogen storage disorder. Okay. Now, how will you differentiate type 0 and Cori's? Type 0, the glycogen that is stored in the liver is nil. This was asked in the latest NEAT PG. The history was in between meals, the child presents with hypoglycemia. There is also exercise intolerance. Okay. And there was zero glycogen that is stored in liver. In that case, what will be your answer? It is type 0 glycogen storage disorder, which is caused by the defect of glycogen synthase. Whereas if it's Cori's disease, where it's a debranching enzyme defect, an abnormal glycogen with multiple branch point will accumulate. Do you understand this? Abnormal glycogen with multiple branch points accumulate in Cori's disease. No glycogen storage in type 0 glycogen storage disorder. Von Gierke's will present only with hypoglycemia, no exercise intolerance. And additionally, Von Gierke's, you should also remember about... Um, uh, dolls, doll like faces. Please remember doll like faces, hepatomegaly, renomegaly. Okay, so this is how you can differentiate these conditions. Okay, so inborn errors, uh, you will have to learn about glycogen storage disorders, glycosphingolipidosis, mucopolysaccharidosis, and of course, inborn errors of amino acid metabolism. And as far as inborn errors of amino acid metabolism is concerned, do not forget to learn about alkaptonuria. Yeah, this has been asked so many times because alkaptonuria is quite common in India. Yeah, in a tribal population, alkaptonuria is quite common. That is why it's being frequently asked in Indian competitive exams. So alkaptonuria, the history will be very classical. Urine turns dark on standing. Alkaptan means black. And it is caused by the defect of Homogentisate oxidase. What is your doubt? DKH. All glycogen storage or liposomal. What is it? No. All glycogen storage disorders or liposomal storage. No, they are not. What do you mean by that? You mean lysosomal storage disorders? No. The only glycogen storage disorder which is also a lysosomal storage disorder is type 2 glycogen storage disorder. Not the remaining okay yeah so alkaptonuria is caused by the defect of which enzyme homogentisate oxidase so you'll have to learn about alkaptonuria you'll have to learn about phenylketonuria yeah and then maple syrup urine disease homocystinurias cystinuria so these are the five disorders that you'll have to definitely learn about okay so what are the conditions you'll have to learn about alkaptonuria homocystinuria phenylketonuria maple syrup urine disease and cystinuria okay now apart from inborn errors of metabolism you should have an overview of metabolism nobody is going to ask you the steps involved in any of the metabolic pathways have you ever seen an MCQ asking you to pick up the right choice of sequence of steps in metabolism? They never ask you. So don't spend your time and energy in memorizing all the steps, right? What you should know is you should understand overview of every metabolic pathway. If it's glycolysis, you should know, okay, in glycolysis, glucose gets split into two pyruvate. That way I get seven ATPs. The rate limiting enzyme is phosphofructokinase 1. What are the inhibitors of glycolysis? How is it regulated? This is how you have to learn. Don't spend your time and energy in memorizing all the steps. Okay. So as far as metabolism is concerned, when I say overview, you should know what happens in the fed state and starvation. They often ask, often ask you this, right? What happens in fed state and starvation? How are all these enzymes regulated? Not all enzymes. Learn about how phosphofructokinase 1 gets regulated. Learn about how gluconeogenesis is getting regulated. Fatty acid oxidation is getting regulated. So enzyme regulation, chief enzyme regulation you will have to learn. 
and then chemical inhibitors of enzymes for example they often ask you fluoride inhibits what what is your answer all of you answer fluoride inhibits enolase right iodoacetate inhibits what iodoacetate inhibits glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase so these chemical inhibitors you will have to learn about okay so often they ask you question about fed state and starvation what happens when the energy level is high what happens when the energy level is low what if there is insulin what if there is glucagon so the overall view is what is expected uh, as far as metabolism is concerned okay and apart from metabolism practical aspects so what are the practical aspects in biochemistry do you think it's less no yeah it is not less so how many of you think that biochemistry is just a pre clinical subject the main reason behind why i want to teach uh, biochemistry to all students is because this way i will be able to tell you all that biochemistry is not just a pre clinical subject it is completely clinical right most of the diagnosis yeah you know management of a patient is based on the diagnosis that you do and most of these diagnosis is done based on laboratory investigations most of the laboratory investigations are biochemical okay not knowing biochemistry will be will you be able to treat a critically ill patient no okay so there are so many practical aspects as far as biochemistry is concerned for example blood collection tubes yeah sample collection strategies this you should be very clear about okay so sample collection you will have to learn about all investigations particularly renal function test liver function test when i say renal function test you will have to learn about urea creatinine electrolyte estimation okay liver function test bilirubin sgot a I mean sgot sgpt alp and then cardiac function test thyroid function test please learn about electrophoresis okay they often ask you question about hemoglobin electrophoresis lipoprotein electrophoresis serum protein electrophoresis so electrophoresis you should be very clear about as well as chromatography okay so all these are essential yeah when you ask me investigations do they ever ask investigations they do do you remember they asked you hba1c the most widely used method for hba1c estimation is what will be your answer widely used method for hba1c estimation is cation exchange chromatography please memorize it it is cation exchange chromatography and then they asked you which is the most specific method for creatinine estimation do you all remember that the most specific method for creatinine estimation is specific is enzymatic okay enzymatic method so all these techniques you should be very clear about okay good shake yes you're right and then of course abg analysis okay as i said critically ca- critically ill patient can be treated by electrolyte estimation you will have to be estimating arterial blood gas analysis so you should have a thorough understanding of abg analysis report interpretation okay so put together this is what i want you to learn as far as biochemistry is concerned but of course there can be questions on nutrition yeah they asked you fat sugar baby is what is answer simple mcq one liner fat sugar baby is quashiaka and then they asked you a child presents with voracious appetite yeah voracious appetite and then a child presents with edema you will have to know to differentiate between quashiaka and marasmus and then they ask you about glycemic index okay so diets so all these you'll have to be clear about yeah nutrition yeah you do uh, abg at micu right you right so nutrition so these are the topics and of course alcohol metabolism yeah alcohol metabolism is a frequently asked topic okay so are you clear about these topics though the list of topic uh, sounds extensive as i told you it's all about smart learning it is not just about hard work it is all about smart work so you should know how to learn what to learn and when to learn okay and that is why we are all here so in all my sessions i cover all these high yield topics in such a way that till today 90 percentage of the mcqs i can even say 95 percentage of the mcqs which have been asked in all the exams be it inict or fmg or neat pg 
have always been covered in all our classes okay so now let's discuss few mcqs based on these top topics okay so try to answer this i will not dig more into it i will just tell you an outline of few mcq so that you get a hang of what to read for neat pg or next pg that's not going to differ okay so as i always say next pg is going to be a replication of usmle step 1 that is what they are trying to do okay so try to have a look at how usmle step 1 questions are asked there will be a straight forward question which only expects you to understand apply and answer okay so you should have your logical thinking logical reasoning always active and that is going to be possible only when you learn conceptually so try to answer this a 55 year old alcoholic was brought to the emergency department by his friends during their usual hangout at the local bar he had passed out and they were unable to revive him on admission his blood glucose was 55 mg per deciliter is it normal or abnormal 55 mg per deciliter is hypoglycemia do you all know that hypoglycemia is common in alcoholic yeah an alcoholic is prone to develop repeated episodes of hypoglycemia the question is what is the explanation for hypoglycemia in an alcoholic what is answer agni says it is a hosamani says it's a all of you say it's a do you all think it's a thiamine deficiency of course thiamine deficiency is common in an alcoholic but in an alcoholic when there is thiamine deficiency that only causes neurological manifestations what are the neurological manifestations that you observe have you heard of wernick's encephalopathy had the question been what is the cause of wernick's encephalopathy in a chronic alcoholic then your answer is right thiamine deficiency or it presents as korsakoff syndrome okay here they are not asking you for neurological manifestation they are asking you for hypoglycemia the reason for hypoglycemia is low pyruvate and low oxaloacetate do you all know that the first step of gluconeogenesis what is glycolysis please even if you know nothing about glycolysis till today please understand glycolysis is a process wherein one molecule of glucose gets split into two molecules of pyruvate So what is gluconeogenesis you start from two molecules of pyruvate you end up in one molecule of glucose okay and the reason behind hypoglycemia in a chronic alcoholic is low pyruvate and low oxaloacetate and why does this happen it is because of the way alcohol gets metabolized so we all know alcohol is rch2oh that is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to form an aldehyde and then aldehyde dehydrogenase converts its aldehyde into an acid and both these dehydrogenases remove hydrogen from alcohol and aldehyde giving it to its coenzyme nad which forms nadh and this was asked in the latest neat pg a chronic alcoholic has got a very high nadh nad ratio please understand this what is the ratio that is higher in a chronic alcoholic high nadh nad ratio this gets translated as high atp adp ratio so energy status of a chronic alcoholic is very high and that is why an alcoholic does not feel hungry the all alcoholic often misses mixed balanced diet and that is why they present with vitamin deficiencies you know all vitamins all micronutrients are supposed to be supplied by the diet when a chronic alcoholic skips meals there is no essential micronutrient causing micronutrient deficiency but additionally when there is high nadh nad ratio what happens to all the pyruvate all the pyruvate become lactate and all oxaloacetate become malate fortified alcohol yes we wish we can fortify alcohol we wish alcohol can be fortified with all vitamins so that an alcoholic can happily drink and stay and stay healthy okay but uh, none of the alcohols can be fortified because of its chemi chemical nature okay so when there is high nadh nad ratio all pyruvate become lactate all oxaloacetate become malate so there is low pyruvate and low oxaloacetate and the first step of gluconeogenesis is please memorize it what is the first step of gluconeogenesis pyruvate will be acted upon by pyruvate carboxylase and it becomes oxaloacetate 
in this case low pyruvate low oxaloacetate so gluconeogenesis is suppressed that is why they are prone to develop hypoglycemia so all of you tell me what are the what are the features that you have learnt about an alcoholic metabolism an alcoholic metabolic status is high nadh nad ratio which gets translated as high atp adp ratio energy status is high so the person skips meals that is why they are prone to develop essential micronutrient deficiencies the first micronutrient to become deficient will be thiamine and that is why acute thiamine deficiency presents as vernix encephalopathy chronic thiamine deficiency will present as korsakoff syndrome and additionally high nadh nad ratio will convert all pyruvate to lactate all oxaloacetate to malate so low pyruvate and low oxaloacetate gluconeogenesis is impaired and that is why they present with hypoglycemia i just now told you alpha acharya do you understand this so alpha acharya's question is why do they present with thiamine deficiency so let me tell you all the causes the person skips meals and it's the diet which is supposed to provide you with micronutrients so there is going to be micronutrient deficiency that is one cause the next cause is alcohol interferes with thiamine absorption so even if uh, the alcoholic happens to be a, a learned person okay a learned person will know that an alcoholic presents with thiamine deficiency so this learned person starts popping in thiamine tablets even in that case they are prone to develop thiamine deficiency because alcohol interferes with thiamine absorption also alcohol interferes with magnesium absorption do you know that it interferes with magnesium absorption without magnesium thiamine cannot be converted to thiamine pyrophosphate okay thiamine kinase is the enzyme which is supposed to convert thiamine to thiamine pyrophosphate this kinase is dependent on magnesium and alcoholic there is no magnesium so active form of thiamine cannot be synthesized so have i answered all your questions alpha so that's the answer for this question low pyruvate and low oxaloacetate the same history the same patient with hypoglycemia but the question is different which of the following proteins would have no significant activity in this patient they are asking you when there is hypoglycemia which of the following activities will not be present okay so um which of the following proteins would have no significant activity in this patient okay so in hypoglycemia will you all agree with me if i say glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis will be stimulated if you are hypoglycemic you have to increase your blood glucose how will you increase your blood glucose by stimulating your glycogenolysis in the liver and by stimulating gluconeogenesis in the liver So in a hypoglycemic individual what do you think about very good hosa mani is right vignesh shankaran is also right the answer is glucokinase but let me help you exclude all these choices okay so in hypoglycemia glycogenolysis has to be stimulated and glycogen phosphorylase is the enzyme of glycogenolysis which will be stimulated okay so we have excluded choice c similarly glut1 transporter glut1 transporter is the one which is present in neurons rbcs and placenta and do you all know that for neurons rbcs and placenta glucose is indispensable yeah you cannot afford to not give glucose to neurons rbcs and placenta that is why glut1 transporters have very high affinity for glucose so that even when there is hypoglycemia glut1 transporter will continue passing glucose into these cells So GLUT1 transport is going to be active even when there is hypoglycemia. So what are you left with? You are left with choice A glucokinase and choice B hexokinase. So you will have to know what are the differences between glucokinase and hexokinase, okay? So understand this. The first difference is based on location. Okay? So where is hexokinase present? Hexokinase is present in all cells. whereas glucokinase is present in liver and pancreatic beta cells 
yeah please memorize every fact as and when i tell you because every minute counts and every second counts okay so hexokinase is present in all cells but glucokinase is present in liver and pancreatic beta cells the second difference is based on affinity and km for those of you who don't know this affinity and km are inversely proportional higher km means lower affinity and vice versa glucokinase enzyme which is present in liver and pancreatic beta cells exhibits lower affinity or higher km okay this the enzyme which is present in liver and pancreatic beta cell exhibits lower affinity or higher km for glucose can you tell me why it is because any dietary glucose thank you so much for biochemistry so interesting will get my dream branch being an integral uh, this made my day numo sisters i am very happy that you will be getting uh, the dream branch uh, of you my best wishes and congratulations and always happy to help missing my classes i'm always there on youtube you can watch my youtube session anytime yeah it is respect of the field that you choose you can anytime come back and watch okay yeah so what was i telling you so why should the enzyme that is present in liver have lower affinity it is because anything that is present in the diet gets absorbed and it gets into the liver first right so liver is the organ to meet any dietary glucose first so tell me what would have happened if liver was provided with an enzyme with higher affinity for glucose then liver would have used all glucose for its own so peripheral tissues would have suffered from hypoglycemia liver would have acted like a filter for glucose liver would have used all glucose for its own so peripheral tissues would have suffered from hypoglycemia such a scenario is not necessary and that is why liver has got an enzyme with lower affinity for glucose so that liver will be able to use glucose only when the glucose concentration is more than what is required for peripheral tissues okay so the enzyme which is present in liver and pancreatic beta cells exhibits lower affinity or higher km for glucose uh feel like what to do after all struggle which finally got end uh, should we start studying for pg branch yes Yes, Numo sisters. Just now I told you, every minute counts, every second counts, at any point in your life. Yeah, you can be in any phase of your life, but time is precious. Okay, so I am not saying you should be learning and reading all twenty-four hours, but then if you have enough time, you can schedule it in such a way that that can be a balance. Even if you have not taken up a course yet, there are there is uh, so much scope for you to learn. okay you can just read a medical journal try to understand what is the latest happening in the field and um, that way you can keep yourself updated okay okay so that's about the difference between hexokinase and glucokinase okay so the other two differences i'm not going to tell you now all that i want you to understand is glucokinase has got lower affinity when it has got lower affinity will it be active when there is hypoglycemia it is not going to be active when there is hypoglycemia so what is the question the question is in hypoglycemia thank you nemo sisters so in hypoglycemia which will not be active glucokinase will not be active and that is a right answer okay now did i tell you sample collection strategies questions can be asked okay so the additive that is used in the given blood collection tube is what is the right answer how many of you have collected blood what color tube do you see here it's a red top tube okay so for red top tube answer is silica excellent dr k very good shake agni says a so a sodium fluoride is gray top okay that's not red top sodium fluoride is gray top okay so answer is silica and i have a mnemonic for a red top tube it is rss so what does rss stand for r stands for red s stands for silica and the next s stands for serum okay red silica serum which means the red top tube is used for serum separation not for plasma separation reason being this tube has got silica which is a clot activator 
okay so a general outline on how blood collection tubes evolve so that you'll be able to understand this initially when we started collecting blood sample for investigation purposes we just collected blood sample in a glass tube okay and then we would allow the clot to happen the negative charges of the glass will stimulate in vitro clotting after in vitro clotting what separates above is called as serum okay so initially we were dependent on serum but later we found out that when 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 you have to leave the clot to happen it takes a longer period of time a good one hour or one and a half hours will get wasted for you to uh, allow the blood sample to undergo clotting that is when we thought of using anticoagulants because when you are adding anticoagulant you don't have to wait you can immediately centrifuge when you centrifuge something comes as a supernatant and what comes above is called as plasma so how to remember this what is the difference between serum and plasma listen to this if you collect a blood sample in which you have placed an anticoagulant if you collect a blood sample in which you have placed an anticoagulant what separates above is plasma whereas if you collect a blood sample and if the negative charges of the tube stimulates in vitro clotting after clotting what separates above is called the serum so serum does not have clotting factors do you all understand this um plain bulb yeah it's not a plain bulb there is a clot activator uh please repeat why lower affinity for glucokinase i will tell you as at the end of the session i'll tell you okay i'll repeat this at the end of the session so what was i telling you serum does not have clotting factors plasma will have all clotting factors including fibrinogen and initially what we were using is only serum sample but then we didn't want to waste time by allowing the blood sample to undergo clotting so we started using anticoagulant like edta but then we understood that edta will interfere with many biochemical analysis so at least for the blood sample that needs to be sent to biochemical laboratory yeah you're not supposed to add any anticoagulant because all these anticoagulants like edta will chelate calcium when calcium gets chelated the calcium value that is estimated will be falsely low and the low calcium that is found in plasma will interfere with many enzyme assays so ast alt alp all these values that you estimate will be falsely low and that is why we thought okay no interfering substance for biochemical analysis and that's why we started using serum for biochemistry alone but even here we don't want to wait for a longer period so we are going to add a clot activator which allows the clotting to happen quickly and what separates above is serum and that clot activator is silica okay so what is the mnemonic for red top tube it is rss red silica serum separation silica is a clot activator and red top tube is used for all biochemical analysis like serum urea serum creatinine serum electrolytes serum pth all hormone estimation everything you will be using a red top tube okay now tell me what is this color it's a gray topped tube g for g gray top tube is used for glucose estimation and for glucose estimation the anticoagulant that is used is sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate very good all of you good yeah gray top tube is used for glucose estimation and the ad additive that is added in this tube is sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate what is this color lavender top tube whenever you collect blood sample in lavender top tube do you remember you sending it to a pathology laboratory yeah and what is done in pathology laboratory complete blood count lavender top tube has got k2 edta yeah it's either k2 edt or k3 edt it is used for complete blood count that is done in a pathology laboratory or it is also used for hb a1c estimation so this can be asked to you glycated hemoglobin what is the method that is used i told you for glycated hemoglobin it is cation exchange chromatography what is the tube that is used it's a k2 edt tube or lavender top tube okay what color is this blue right blue top tube is citrated and c for c citrated tube is used for coagulation assays for example you are estimating prothrombin time or activated partial thromboplastin time pt aptt fibrinogen 
okay so all these can be estimated in a blue top tube because blue has got citrate to be very specific it is 3.2 percentage citrate yeah ptinr and this is a green topped tube g is followed by h right green top tube is heparinized and what is this heparinized tube used for a quicker biochemical analysis as i told you for biochemistry what is preferred a red top tube is preferred but it will take half an hour for clot to happen even if there is silica so if you want a quicker estimation of any parameter for example intraoperative pth okay so a surgeon who is removing parathyroid gland will send a blood sample intraoperatively blood sample will be taken that is sent to the laboratory and they want pth to be estimated and only when they find pth value to be negligible they'll close it okay so that you cannot be waiting for clot to happen so if you want quicker analysis in biochemistry then we use heparin which is a green top tube and the same green top tube is also used for cytogenetic analysis abg no lakshmi for abg do you collect it in a tube or do you collect it in a syringe for arterial blood gas analysis you should be collecting it in a self filling pre filled heparinized syringe yeah that is totally different this is a tube this tube is not used for abg do you understand the difference so do you see a gel in the bottom right so this is called as gel and clot tube so what will you use is gel and clot tube for this is used when sample has to be transported for a prolonged period of time or when the sample has to be stored for a longer period of time that is when we use a gel and a clot tube so yellow top you can call it as yellow top you can call it as gold top so all these tubes have gel in the bottom so we collect blood sample into this tube and then we centrifuge it when we centrifuge it the gel will come and stand between cells in the bottom and serum on the top so anything which happens in the cell layer will not come and disturb the serum so if you have to transport the sample or if you have to store the sample then you'll have to collect the blood sample in a gold top or yellow top tube which has got gel okay so tell me quickly tell me what is the purpose red tube red serum silica okay and this is great top tube used for glucose estimation g for g glucose estimation it has got sodium fluoride and potassium oxalate k2 edta tube is used for complete blood count very good all of you yes k2 edta tube is used for complete blood count and it's also used for hba1c estimation and then blue top tube has got citrate used for coagulation assays green top tube has got heparin and this is used for quicker biochemical analysis and for cytogenetic analysis yellow top or gold color that has got gel and this is used for sample transportation and storage so i'm going to wait for you to answer because it's a pyq i hope you have all started working on previous year questions yeah so a child presented with difficulty in vision on examination no difficulty in vision on examination cherry red spots were seen on macula there was no organomegaly so whenever there is a case based mcq please do not fumble yeah please don't get uh, scared of case based mcqs because in case based mcqs there are two steps that you need to follow step number 1 is summarize step number 2 is to exclude choices so if you summarize here you see neurological manifestations inability to see is neurological and there is cherry red spot and there is no hepatospleno megaly that is a summary based on this what are the choices that you can exclude i am going to straight away exclude gotcher's disease because cherry red spots are not seen in kgf how many of you watched the movie kgf yeah so what does kgf stand for here k stands for crabs disease g stands for gotchers and f stands for fabries okay no cherry red spot in gotchers so i am going to exclude gotchers similarly hunters 
yeah hunters does not have any cherry red spot right hunters is a mucopolysaccharidosis wherein even corneal clouding is not observed so this is not hunters so between tay sachs and neiman pick i'm going to exclude neiman pick because organomegaly is a feature of neiman pick which is caused by sphingomyelinase deficiency okay sphingomyelinase deficiency is neiman pick which can present with cherry red spot but you will not uh, but you will see organomegaly so no organomegaly is a feature of gm2 gangliosidosis Okay, so no organomegaly is a feature of GM2 gangliosidosis and Krabs disease. So what is answer here? The answer here is Tay Sachs. Okay, so I am going to tell you few facts or one liners that you can memorize as far as glycosphingolipidosis are concerned. Okay, so the first fact is no mental retardation. Okay, no mental retardation in GF. How do we remember this? We always say girlfriends are smart. Don't we say that? Yeah, girlfriends are smart. So no mental retardation GF. What does GF stand for? Gauchers and Fabris. Okay, that is point number one. Um, yeah, I will tell you DK. Okay, and the next fact is no cherry red spot. Okay, no cherry red spot in KGF. What did I tell you KGF stands for? Cramps, Gauchers and Fabris. Third fact is no organomegaly. Okay, only neurological manifestations. No organomegaly is a feature of type 2, no, GM2 gangliosidosis. That's a feature of GM2 gangliosidosis and Krabs disease. So, what are the two conditions which are included in GM2 gangliosidosis? One is Tay Sachs, the other one is Sandoff. Okay, Tay Sachs and Sandoff come under GM2 gangliosidosis. Tay Sachs is caused by the defect of hexosaminidase A gene. Sandoff is caused by the defect of hexosaminidase B gene. Okay, yeah, very good, Hosamani. So, what is the right answer here? The right answer here is. For that question, it was Tay Sachs because Neiman Pick will present with organomegaly. So this is also a NEAT PG 2023, no, 20, yeah, 2023 MCQ. Uh, a child presents with dementia, diarrhea and dermatitis. It's a very simple MCQ. I would say this is the most frequently asked topic. Right. So what is that you observe here? Diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia. Three Ds of Pellagra. So, 3 Ds of Pellagra caused by what? Niacin deficiency. Very good. Answer is vitamin B3. A child is presented with dermatitis, thinning of hair and alopecia. The family gives history of eating raw egg whites for a long time. Which of the following vitamin deficiencies is most likely to be the case or the cause? Yeah, thinning of hair. So, how, how many of you have seen uh, you or your friends taking biotin gummies? biotin gummies for hair fall and for good nails yeah biotin is necessary for many metabolic functions and it helps in hair growth and nail growth so this is a child presenting with thinning of hair and egg white intake so egg white is rich in avidin and avidin comes and binds to biotin that causes biotin malabsorption so what is answer here answer is b7 or biotin A child presents with refractory anemia. Below is provided the smear of bone marrow biopsy of the child. The probable enzyme deficiency is. Yeah, again frequently asked question. Refractory anemia. Anemia, thrombocytopenia. Okay, and what do you see histopathologically? Do you see tissue paper cells? Yeah, if you see this combination, what is answer here? It is Gauchers disease. And Gauchers disease is caused by the defect of beta glucosal cerebrosidase. Okay, it is caused by the defect of beta glucosal cerebrosidase. So, answer is choice A. Okay, so what are the other facts that you will have to remember about Gauchers disease? So, first is which enzyme defect? It is beta glucosidase or beta glucosal cerebrosidase. When this enzyme is defective, the, the uh, precursor. Glucosal cerebroside accumulates in the membranes of RBCs and platelets. 
that makes these rbcs and platelets abnormal so macrophages engulf these rbcs and platelets that causes anemia and thrombocytopenia and after macrophages engulf these cells membranes of these cells will accumulate like fibrils and these fibrils will make it look like crumpled tissue paper so crumpled tissue paper appearance with anemia thrombocytopenia is gaucher's disease caused by the defect of beta glucosidase enzyme okay now what about alpha glucosidase defect i told you right alpha glucosidase is pompey's disease alpha glucosidase defect is pompey's disease and this is the only glycogen storage disorder which is also a lysosomal storage disorder and what did i tell you about hexosaminidase a defect hexosaminidase a defect is tay sachs b defect is sandoff both are collectively called as gm2 gangliosidosis okay it's an interesting question there is history of village people consuming a crop as a staple diet many of the villagers are now presenting with paresis and using a stick to stand yeah, if you see stick to stand you should think of which condition very good answer is vitamin c this is also a neat pg 2023 mcq this is osteolathyrism okay osteolathyrism is caused by the intake of lathyrus odoratus seeds and uh, the toxic principle that is present in lathyrus odorata seed is beta amino propionitrile yeah what is it beta amino propionitrile that uh, that does not allow collagen cross linkages to be formed so if you know collagen cross linkage formation deformity is the cause of osteolathyrism in a group of individuals whom you know that they consume lathyrus odoratus what should be given as a uh, prevention as a preventive measure you can give vitamin c because vitamin c promotes cross linkages in collagen okay so bova is not osteolathyrism that is neurolathyrism answer please a family consuming predominantly of polished rice would present with which of the following vitamin deficiencies match the vitamin deficiency with the investigation did i tell you yeah do you see so many questions on vitamin c we saw a question on uh, so many questions on vitamins we already saw a question on biotin then a question on vitamin c now a question on thiamine yeah polished rice will cause thiamine deficiency because thiamine is present in the alluvian layer of rice so polishing removes that layer and if you suspect thiamine deficiency what will you estimate it is rbc transketolase activity yeah thiamine is b1 right thiamine is b1 one can be remembered as one meal a day yeah one meal a day is a part of keto diet so for vitamin b1 one meal a day keto so what will you estimate you will estimate transketolase activity so don't forget this okay now riboflavin is glutathione reductase activity how do you remember it whenever you suspect riboflavin or b2 deficiency you have to estimate rbc glutathione reductase activity it can be remembered as ribbon and glue yeah ribbon and glue going hand in hand as far as art work is concerned so riboflavin deficiency what will you estimate rbc glutathione reductase activity and what did i tell you very good sam what did i tell you about pyridoxin deficiency pyridoxin is b6 six ends with which letter x so what will you estimate you will estimate xanthiurinic acid levels in urine okay then i tell you you have to have an overall understanding of metabolism they are not asking you specific questions in metabolism when there is low insulin glucagon ratio which means what is high glucagon level is high when will glucagon level be high whenever there is hypoglycemia okay so they are asking you in hypoglycemia which of the following enzymes is stimulated in hypoglycemia will you stimulate glycogen synthase glycogen synthase is an enzyme of glycogen synthesis and you will synthesize glycogen only when there is hyperglycemia 
Similarly, phosphofructokinase 1 is a rate limiting enzyme of glycolysis. When will you stimulate glycolysis? Only when there is high glucose because that is the precursor. So, what is the right answer here? The right answer here is hormone sensitive lipase. Because what is the function of hormone sensitive lipase? It is present in adipose tissue. And it acts on adipose tissue triacyl glycerol will cleave it to give glycerol and fatty acid. Then both glycerol and fatty acid will come out of adipose tissue, will reach the circulation. So tell me what is the function of hormone sensitive lipase? It helps in peripheral lipolysis in adipose tissue. So lipolysis is a catabolic process. So I have told you about hormone sensitive lipase so many times in all my sessions. It's a catabolic enzyme. And it gets inhibited by the anabolic hormone insulin. And it is stimulated by all catabolic hormones like glucagon. So glucagon stimulates hormone sensitive lipase. Um, yeah. Glucagon stimulates hormone sensitive lipase and hypoglycemia. So the answer here is choice B. Okay. Which of the following micronutrient deficiencies can cause poor wound healing? Yeah, poor wound healing is because of zinc deficiency. Yeah, zinc deficiency because zinc is necessary for matrix metalloproteinase activity. And matrix metalloproteinase is necessary for wound healing. So whenever you asked about poor wound healing, what will come into your mind? It should be zinc. Okay. Biochemical basis of scurvy is, what is the right answer? Scurvy or vitamin C deficiency presents with bleeding gums, right? Why does it present with bleeding gums? It is because vitamin C is necessary for collagen cross-linkage formation. Without collagen cross-linkages, subendothelial uh, connective tissue will be weaker. And that is why even when you brush, there is bleeding gums. So it is because of impact collagen synthesis. It is not about keratinization, Hosamani. Answer is impact collagen synthesis. When do you see increased keratinization of epithelium? It is vitamin A deficiency. Okay. So vitamin A suppresses keratinization of epithelium. That is why in vitamin A deficiency, there is excessive keratinization. And that is why it causes follicular hyperkeratosis. And that is why it presents with conjunctival xerosis. Excessive keratinization of conjunctival epithelium causes xerosis. Okay. And vitamin K deficiency causes inhibition of clotting factors. So, have you understood uh, what kind of questions are being asked in NEET PG or NEXT PG? It's all about applied biochemistry. How will you be able to answer applied biochemistry MCQs? Only when you learn the topic and the subject conceptually. Okay. So, even if you had been in the factual learning mode, please switch over to conceptual learning mode because next exam will always be applied. Okay. So, with that, I am going to end the session today. And I will meet you all tomorrow at 6 p.m. So at 6 p.m. we have another YouTube session. And um, this that will be a continuation of today's session. Okay. Thank you.